Thank you. I guess everybody can hear me. Okay, all right. So, uh, thanks, Reza. It's a pleasure to have a chance to talk about this topic uh, because I have a long history with ISR as well as materials community on this campus. And I really love the, the relationship between nano things, materials and structures, and systems. Having lived in industry for over half of my career, uh, I'm a believer that value is always realized at the systems level. So I have the great pleasure to try to bring these two perspectives together here. And that's the good part. Uh, the bad part is I'll probably do an injustice to both of them. So <laughs> with your forgiveness, I'll just go ahead with that. Yes. OK, so I'm going to give you a little bit of motivation for the topic. And then I want to give you a feeling for the nanostructures that we're working on, the processes and structures that are involved, the devices that we tried to construct, and then tell you about some of the activities in this Energy Frontier Research Center, which we uh, have on the Maryland campus uh, with our partners elsewhere. And then I want to turn to systems and try to speak to the issues in systems that go all the way from integration of systems at the nano level to the micro level to the macro or even global level and uh, talk about the key issues that I think are involved there. So to give credit, first of all, uh, let me recognize uh, some of the people in my research group here. You see the names listed here. Some have left already. Uh, my collaborator, Saibak Lee, in the chemistry department and his group, and I see some of them are, are here today. And uh, Ray Adamidas has been a, a great partner in a lot of this work and continues to be. And then this is the set of researchers in our Energy Frontier Research Center. The work has been sponsored by the Department of Energy, and this is the logo for our, our center, uh, the Nano Center. This, the Nano Center at Sandia and Los Alamos is called the Center integrated nanotechnologies. And the early work was sponsored as a seed project from the MERSEC and continuing funding from LPS Micropower uh, uh, Program. So what do we care about here? Uh, you all know about electric cars. Uh, the Chevy Volt is making lots of news here. There's a picture of it. This blue thing here is a lithium ion battery that's in the Chevy Volt. And here are some specifications here. And I won't ask you to read all these specifications, I'll just summarize them. This thing can go 25 to 50 miles, so you can take it to work if you live close enough. It would be borderline for me, I guess, a uh, little bit risky. And so it has a gasoline engine to, to back up and recharge the batteries that are in this. This battery weighs uh, 200 pounds or more. It's kind of the size of the engine, so it's a big component of the car. And if you bring it home at night, you can plug it into your 110 volt outlet as long as you stay home for the night because it takes 10 hours to charge. If you have a big fat cable that runs 220, you might do this in four hours. But what do you do for a gas station when you're driving on the highway? <coughs> you know, now and then you pull over to get gas. Well, there isn't one yet. You're starting to see uh, meters in the DC area where if you park for a while, you can charge while you're there, but that's only a couple of hours. That's not going to do the job. If anyone thinks this is a good solution, uh, I'm not in agreement. So I think something is needed here. And that, this is just used conventional energy, because one way or another, this energy is either coming from uh, carbon uh, fuel sources, conventional sources, or from wherever your electric uh, company is deriving its power. And that, that's typically conventional sources. Not a good solution. Then we talk about renewables. And we know we need them for the increase in demand of energy, and we'd love to replace some of the dirty sources that we have. So get solar, great if you're in the uh, southwest, uh, not so great other places, not too bad. Uh, you have to put these panels someplace to capture that energy. There's lots of it, but it's not easy. And then <coughs> wind is scattered all over the place, and we know that we have some wind farms that are being talked about on the Atlantic coast. And that may change things as well, but we certainly need to store these pieces of energy and then transport them over long distances. 
More importantly is the time dependence of these sources. So this is what wind looks like. This is the night time. Uh, that's when you get the wind power. During the day, it's not very effective. <coughs> Solar power is only good during the day. But look, there's lots of structure on this time dependent structure. And of course, this is the demand curve. This is when you want power. The match between these isn't very good. And so, and, and more importantly, these will change day to day or even, even uh, 10 minutes at a time, uh, depending on the weather. And so we need ways to store energy. So this business of storage is really critical. And I like to think of storage as the currency of the energy economy. If you can store energy and then use it someplace at another time, it's essentially like a dollar or a euro, even better. Uh, or yeah, it provides liquidity in an efficient marketplace. So we really need this, and I think this has been recognized uh, very widely over the last five or ten years. So the next question you should ask is why nano? That was in the topic of this talk. If you go to the Hirshhorn Museum in DC, you'll see this, and I was bowled over when I saw it because I couldn't help but think that this is the battery of the future. Here's the anode. There's the cathode and the electrolyte is all around here. And this is what we want to build. Uh, scale down by orders of magnitude, of course. So this picture to me is a good way of understanding why we think in terms of nanostructure solutions. First of all, all this hype you've heard about in nano, and there's even some reality there. I guess I'd better say that as nano center director. Uh, it, it's real. We can build things that look like this. And so nanostructure synthesis is something we can piggyback on. But you, when you look at this, you see that for the amount of material here, there's a lot of surface area. And that's really useful for nano It'll, and for batteries and all charge storage uh, materials. Because the electrolyte that may carry the lithium ions in your lithium ion battery, as an example, can get to all this material in between these, these rods or wires can get to all that material where we want to store the lithium in an anode structure. We can have very thin layers of storage material here. And what that means is really important because it's all about power. You can't just have high energy density. You have to have high power density so you can recharge the battery quickly. You can deal with the need for acceleration in your car, you can deal with the transients of wind and solar energy. And that all comes from the fact that the transport time of carriers depends on the diffusion length and the diffusion coefficient. Those is the square of the diffusion length. So you can easily get lots of lithium into a material at the surface, but if you want to use all that material, you've got to wait a long time for it to diffuse in. And what you want in your battery for high power is to move that very fast between the materials. So the trick here is to make sure that the charge carriers, the lithium ions, let's say, in this electrolyte, can get to all of this material. And in this kind of structure, it can. It can walk down the pathway here and enter the door right here into the end of the material. And of course, have high energy density. You don't want to give up too much volume. So what you really want to do is to make these kind of structures as dense as possible so that you're using as much of that volume as you can. OK, so what do we do for the processes and structures for nano? Well, we use lots of material synthesis methods. We exploit what I call the three selves, so self-assembly, let nature arrange things the way we want it to be, if we can understand what those uh, rules of nature are. We want to self-align complex structures, so once there's a an alignment pattern there. We build everything in registry to that. And that's already done by every computer chip, chip you've ever seen. It's used all the time. And we want to use self limiting reaction. I'll get to that later. The structures, as that picture showed you, that we're interested in are high aspect ratio structures, large surface area, access to active materials. But of course, the hard thing is when you have these very long structures, with almost no separation between them, it's hard to make those structures. And so there's a huge uh, responsibility to the process <coughs> to be able to make these kinds of structures. So here's how we make them. One is called vapor liquid solid nanowire growth. You take 
a little dot of a catalyst like gold, you expose it to a reactive material like silane, which has silicon in it, and it grows a silicon nanowire, and the little gold catalyst keeps climbing up the top. And here's what it looks like when it's done. What you see here is a 1,500 nanometer silicon germanium alloy uh, nanowire. It's only 40 nanometers <coughs> wide. And you can make forests of these things, as you see here. And if you look very closely at these, these are perfect crystals. So they're really very nice structures to work with. This is a collaborator Comfort Pro at Los Alamos National Lab. You want to make other kinds of structures with multi-layers. And so here's another approach to doing that. Here I show some nanopores and these holes <coughs> in these gray areas. They've been filled by multiple layers of materials. Some could be current collectors to just move electrons back and forth. Some would be black active materials to hold lithium ions or sodium ions as storage material. Or you can take this kind of structure and essentially remove this part, turn it upside down, and get another kind of structure. So we call these nanotube structures, nanowire structures. The blue stuff is exposed to the electrolyte. So that can be useful in a battery or a capacitor kind of configuration. The way we make this kind of stuff is shown here. This is the structure, a side view, a top view. And so here's a little cartoon that shows you that if you anonically oxidize the aluminum foil in your kitchen, and if you do it right, you get a structure like that. Special voltage, special current, all that kind of stuff. And then you can remove the first uh, aluminum oxide you make, and then you do that again. And you see we made a scalloped surface here, which is very regular because that's how nature wants to build this structure. And we end up with these beautiful uh, structures of nanopores in a regular arrangement to each other. And they have amazing properties. Diameter is in the tens of nanometers, but they can be microns in depth, and very high aspect ratios. And it turns out that these are uh, 100 billion per square inch. So the numbers are huge. Electrochemical deposition is the technique that we can use to take uh, uh, an electrode, here's a copper film, and from an electrolyte solution deposit it, a metal or some other kind of material in the places where the metal is exposed, for example, in these pores that you see here. And this is a way of producing material at the bottom of the pore. I'll show you in a few minutes how to produce material at the top of the pore or all the way into the pore. So, uh, uh, my collaborator, uh, Sengbak Lee, has done some wonderful work which really led us into this whole uh, energy centric uh, business. He took this kind of structure, electro deposited two materials, manganese oxide, which is a good storage material, and PDOT is a conducting polymer that helps the electrons get where they need to go because you've got to move both ions and electrons. And uh, he made uh, this code deposition into the pores, then removed the anonic aluminum oxide template to have these exposed coaxial nanowires. And their performance is really exceptional. As you see here, uh, for manganese oxide films, you have a high capacity for storing charge, but if you try and pull much power or current density out of it, it drops very fast. The nanowires are somewhat better, if you separately look at the conducting polymer materials, the capacity isn't very high. You'd like it to be, but it isn't. But it doesn't fade so badly. If you put the two of them together, you get this, which is that working in concert, this composite nanostructure can store charge and also uh, work at high power levels. That means moving the charge in and out of the storage material very quickly. Another process is atomic layer deposition. Uh, that's where my lab is actually working. And so this uses this idea of self-limiting adsorption and reaction to take two molecules that you normally would put together in a hot environment and they grow a film by chemical reaction and not put them together at the same time, but to let one of them, this is aluminum with methyl groups attached to it. This is water vapor. So expose this one first and then 
pump that away, and then expose that one. So if I can get this to work at the top of that. Uh, <coughs> So what you see happening here, these are the trimethyl aluminum molecules. They see an OH radical, here's hydrogen and oxygen. <coughs> the ligand, the methyl, reacts with the hydrogen. And so at the end of that cycle, what you have is uh, two methyls and the aluminum attached to an oxygen here. And once that happens, you see any other molecules that come along don't bind, don't stick, and don't react. You call that self-limiting. Now if I put water molecules into the system, they'll react the rest of these little methyl groups and take away a reaction from it from the surface. So what's happened at this point is that we've created a single monolayer, atomic or molecular layer, on the surface by this atomic layer deposition process. And every time we do A and then B, we get one more layer. We can just count how thick we need them. And this self-limiting process that I showed you is responsible for allowing us to control the thickness no matter what the topography is of the surface. So these very high aspect ratio pores, we can coat those in, in, in a beautiful fashion. And that's actually the reason why uh, works on this animation step. I'll get there. Oh, I got there too fast. That's why. This process has gone into manufacturing of the memory chip that you have in your computers and the logic chip soon, I think. And it's because you can count the number of pulses and determine how thick the very thin layers are, and you can put them over the most demanding of uh, topography surfaces. So using this process, uh, we built metal insulator metal structures into nanopores, as you see here. So the red is metal, then the orange is insulator, and the red is metal. So this makes it an electrostatic capacitor. And we hit the world record in capacitance density with this kind of structure. So I think it speaks to how powerful nano, uh, nanofabrication can be in making structures for energy. So what's the conclusion of this? Well, this is where we are today. This is lithium-ion batteries, electrochemical capacitors, which are higher power. This is top low to power density, low to energy density. So these are higher power, but lower energy than lithium-ion batteries. Electrostatic capacitors are even higher power and much lower energy density. And the two examples that I just showed you are here. The coaxial metal wire is a data point right here. So it moved both energy and power to higher values from what was conventional. And we believe that that will be possible with <coughs> lithium-ion batteries. We're working on that. And the electrostatic device I showed you moved electrostatic capacitors to <coughs> more than an order of magnitude increase in energy density. The conclusion should be, and I hope you believe it, that nano is good. You can make nanostructures that are helpful. Okay. What else we have learned from thinking hard about this problem is that you can't have just one material in your nanostructure. So if you think about, for example, storing electricity, or let me take capturing sunlight, when a photon is absorbed in the material, you have to do two things to get electricity. It's absorbed and it makes an antiphon, which is an electron hole pair, and you have to do the absorption, and then you have to find the interface where you can separate the <coughs> electron and the hole pair together. That's, that's breaking up an exciton. Then you have to transport the electron and the hole to different alligator clips on your device because you, that's the only way you'll have a voltage. So, so what I want to emphasize here is that you need at least two materials. One to do something like uh, capture the sunlight in an electron hole pair. And the second is to help energy conversion and to move the <coughs> charge carriers where you want it. And this is really um, a pervasive idea about nanostructures for energy or probably for all kinds of other applications. You have to think in terms of building nanostructures which have multiple different materials if you're going to get the multifunctionality out of it that you need. In the case of sunlight, absorb, separate, and then collect your charge. 
Uh, third point that I think is really important is how should we do our work? So lots of people and most all uh, energy storage devices use random nanostructures or aperiodic structures. They're a picture like this here for solar energy, here for uh, <coughs> this one is for a battery material. So that's good because it has high surface area, has lots of little nooks and crannies, and if you think about the transport uh, of getting, for example, a positive charge out the top and a negative charge out the bottom, uh, you should start getting nervous about how well you can control that. So what we think is that building the regular nanostructures that I've shown you as examples is the right way to do it. And for our center, it's really good because we can control what these shapes are, and that means we can do science at a level that would be very difficult here. And secondly, although this is much more controversial, some of us believe that this is where manufacturing is ultimately going to go for next generation uh, energy storage. And uh, well, we'll just have to see if that's how it really works out. But it doesn't affect our, our center as we are now. OK, so this is our center. Uh, our website is right here, EFRCUMD.edu. Uh, it's a uh, Department of Energy Center. You know, two years ago, there were 46 of these announced. They're big programs. And so we have one of about, uh, there are about four that are really serious about electrical energy storage. <coughs> and so we have five years commitment, and we're interested in both in, <coughs> in applications of electrical energy storage to conventional problems like how do you, how do you power uh, electric vehicles, and secondly, how do you deal with renewable sources. So we are Maryland the lead. We have universities in Yale, Florida, and Irvine, and then two national labs, Sandia and Los Alamos. And uh, it's a really nice partnership, I think. And Razor will tell you it's, it's a lot of fun. OK, where are we headed? If you take apart a battery that you have now, this is what it really looks like. You have current collectors for the anode and the cathode. And then you have a mixture of little particles, microparticles, maybe nanoparticles, in conducting a binder that has to hold the particles together. And if I got you worried about how do the charges know where to go, in the example I showed you earlier, and I hope I got you worried here a little bit too, because this binder is just to hold the stuff together. Whether it makes the right paths for transport, we don't really know. I mean, these things work, but do they work well? Uh, and, and also, it contributes to weight. And you know, the battery in the Chevy Volt is 200 pounds, and we like it to be about 10, and it can't be 10. People are now thinking much more about nanostructured electrodes. There's some very nice work at NRL going on, and at UCLA, and so on. And these are looking at aperiodic or more or less random structures, but with the kind of assembly techniques that I've been talking about, electrochemical deposition, uh, atomic layer deposition, and so on. <coughs> Our vision is for these regular heterogeneous structures that look like this, and I think I've shown you this picture already. But what we want is to, to make and study individual nanowires that have multiple materials and large arrays of these nanowires. If we're successful in learning what it is that makes these things work or not work well, how to optimize the design, then that learning can feed back to what one may want to do with more aperiodic structures, so enabling the science to understand some of these cases, and feed this forward. I think I'm losing battery. Feed this forward to the next generation technology. The irony <laughs> Okay, and in the long run, uh, uh, we envision being able to make true nano batteries inside pores and a variety of other three dimensional nanostructures like this. So we're headed there at some, some point in time. Uh, we think about the science problem as. How does transport work? I have a charge storage material for the cathode or for the anode. I have some other material to help uh, stabilize the mechanical structure and to help move charges in and out. Let's the ions get into the storage material from the electron, electrolyte. Let's the electron be transported wherever we need. Uh, Regina just had one here. Okay, I'll 
keep going. Who knows what I'm going to say? Okay, so in our center, some of the work focuses on individual nanostructures. Here's a neat example. This is a single carbon nanotube, which is, has electrodes attached at either end, and it has a gate underneath it. And so it's a field effect transistor built out of a single carbon nanotube. And then we can put uh, electrolyte next to that and introduce counter electrode, reference electrode, and do electrochemistry on this structure. So here's a picture of the source and drain context, the gates on the bottom. This is Phil Collins work at Irvine. Here's the exposed carbon nanotube. And what he's able to do is to prove that from the transport characteristics, there are zero defects between here and here. And then to stress it electrically until he can register that a defect has been created. So there's one defect, and he's actually counted one, two, three, four, five defects, up to five defects, and able to distinguish them. And then once there's a defect that's chemically <coughs> active for putting, for example, uh, new materials like a carboxylic uh, functionalization and then electrodepositing one of our storage materials to make a tiny nanoparticle right here. And to use this transistor as a way to discern the behavior of the charging and discharging of that nanoparticle. So that's quite a science direction. And at the other end of the spectrum, we make massive arrays uh, by top-down lithography or bottom-up self-assembly, as I've shown examples of, to be able to look at how the array behaves and to be able to make comparisons to the behavior of the single nanowire structures. So our center is different from the others in the business, I think in four ways. One is we look at a focus on multi-component nanostructures, <coughs> not new material, and how you design these, uh, these uh, complex uh, heterogeneous nanostructures. Uh, we look at multiple scale from single defects and individual wires to massive arrays, uh, a variety of processes and combinations thereof, and some exciting experimental platforms for looking at how these things happen in real life. So let me give you a couple of Highlights, I think I have a few minutes for this. So this was one of the first ones that came along in Science Magazine. It's uh, apparently on Bill Brinkman's list for, uh, for showing off to Congress in terms of funding all of this, so we're delighted about this. So this was Jen Yu Fong's work at Sandia, and what he did is he made this little structure that goes into a transmission electron microscope, which gives you atomic resolution. And on one side, you have a little wire of lithium cobalt oxide, this is a cathode material. This is an ionic liquid, a drop of electrolyte, which you can actually put in a vacuum, it doesn't evaporate very fast. And with another manipulator, bring a tin oxide nanowire and put it into this little droplet. So this is a nano battery. And what they looked at was how the lithium from the lithium cobalt oxide uh, is transported <coughs> and changes the the tin oxide nanowire that's the anode. And you see pictures of that here. And it turns out that uh, what really happens is, is uh, bulk diffusion driven in this case. But in other kinds of nanowires, it's surface diffusion uh, driven. So here you see a movie. Can I make the movie work? We saw another one, but no battery. <laughs> <laughs> the irony is unbelievable. <laughs> So what you see is this wire. You see that this moving front here? This is the disordered tin oxide that's reacted to form a lithium tin alloy and lithium oxide as the lithium goes into the wire. And this is what's going to happen in any kind of electrochemical system. So understanding this is what we're really after. So this is a, a really neat thing to see, but we have a long ways to go to translate that to some of the applications, I think. Here's another example familiar to some people here. This came straight out of the Gatsi, Culver, and uh, Long groups here on campus. So this is tobacco mosaic virus here. And there are some interesting biological ways that this perfect virus, which is 18 nanometers OD, 4 nanometers ID, 300 nanometers long, can be functionalized to attach to a surface 
And then function-wise, so there's a nickel seed, so you can plate nickel on top of that as a current collector. And then we put uh, different kinds of charged storage materials. This one happens to be an AOD material, titanium oxide. So here you see the TMV with the nickel coating on it, and here's the titanium oxide uh, added to that. And so this gives very nice behavior at that level, but I, what I think it's really neat is this one, which is kind of a hierarchical system that they have in mind, <coughs> that is to take these TMP nano-nano batteries and put on a microstructure uh, so that you can increase the number of these per unit area or per unit volume. And you see a picture of that right here. So all these little fuzzy things that, that look like dirt are actually the active battery material and they're on a pillar. And I think the, the interesting thing is to scale this to smaller and, and higher density pillar structures. Uh, here's some work, this is from uh, Yu Hong Wang in the chemistry department here. And what he's discovered is he found a way to beat this problem, which is the problem is you have a carbon nanotube. I think you all know it has the highest thermal conductivity, mechanical strength, and electrical conductivity of any material we know of. But as soon as you touch it, you make a bond to it and you lose those properties. So what are you going to do about that? It's a great material with no value. <laughs> I'm exaggerating a little bit. But. So, so what, what he advocates is using double wall or multi wall nanotubes so that you control the things you build with them by the outer walls. And the inner wall still maintains those properties that you want. But here's an example. These are double wall carbon nanotubes. This is current as a function of voltage. And if you then uh, functionalize them, on the outside so that you can separate them in solution so they don't aggregate all together or you can bind them some other way which clever chemists know how to do you lose some of the conductivity but only about half of it and so this is still preserving the conductivity of the inner wall and what, what happens is when some of these stop and then another one is lying over them the current has a reasonable uh, a reasonable uh, pathway to jump from one to the other because these distances are so small. On the other hand, if you functionalize the same way, the single ball nanotube, you have no conduction at all. So this is a very clever architectural advance, I think. And the control of it comes in in also a really interesting way. It's the functionalization, the chemical functionalization with carboxyl uh, groups uh, starts at an existing defect and then starts to spread at the periphery of the functionalized region. So first it's, it grows and grows until it surrounds the nanotube all the way around the circumference. And then it can only grow linearly. And so by looking at SEM pictures and measuring the length of the light structures, which are the red ones that are functionalized versus the dark ones, you can get a histogram and start learning how this works. And the picture all fits that the propagation along the nanotube is well defined. And you can see that the structure fit, this is a modeling, oh, now I've lost it. Okay. This? Yeah, okay. So, so the behavior of this follows exactly what we'd expect. That is, once it's covered all the way around, it then propagates linearly. And there are experiments shown here uh, which support that. Okay, now let me talk about systems for the rest of the time and without a flashlight. Uh, system, nanosystems design is where I want to start. You've already seen examples which include two or more materials to make a nanostructure. And uh, so we have to think in terms of multi components for multifunctionality. And of course, the material properties, the 3D geometry, what we can actually make with the synthesis techniques we have, uh, and how we put them together, these are all big challenges in making nanostructures. So here are some examples. Uh, what, you see, what you see here are electrodeposited materials uh, made inside a nanopore. And this uh, yellow thing is the structure of the initial electrode. And by changing the structure of the initial electrode, the distribution of materials in the nanowire can be changed. And you can make, uh, depending on different chemistries, you can make nanoparticles inside of the p dot and so on. Another example is the structure that I showed you earlier from 
AAO. These were our metal insulator metal structures. And they start with that scalloped surface, which unfortunately has sharp peaks. And so those peaks end up at the top here. And when you build a structure that goes over that peak, you have a high field concentration, which leads to low field breakdown and other kinds of characteristics. So we really have to engineer the shape of these things below the nanoscale of the structures that we make in the beginning. Here's another example. This is uh, some work that I, uh, we've been thinking about recently. This is looking at ion transport between uh, this kind of an anode, uh, a cathode and anode structure. These are called trench structures. This is a three-dimensional battery. So this would be interpendent training electrodes with electrolyte in between them. And this modeling exercise that was done by Zedin and, uh, and others shows that when you have these complex three-dimensional structures, the lithium becomes depleted in, in this position and increased, enhanced at this position, so you have very non-uniform behavior. The consequences of these three-dimensional structures on where charges go and how the electrolyte behaves is something we have yet to probe in detail. But I think this is going to be an extremely important part of the challenge that, that we see. So we think about nanostructures in various forms. We start with, this is the example of coaxial nanowires. You make two electrodes like that, you put them in an electrolyte with a separator, and maybe a millimeter in between them, you've got a, a, a supercapacitor structure. And these are exposing the nanostructures to, to the electrolyte. Uh, I gave you the example also of the, the embedded structure, electrostatic supercapacitor. And actually, uh, there's a whole center, actually probably several, uh, using the same kind of model to build solar cells. So here's an example of a solar cell. And I would call these embedded structures. And so the holy grail in this field is probably the 3D solid state nanobattery, which is depicted here. And people are trying to build this thing, including us, uh, but I don't think anybody's made great deal of progress on the campus. But that's the future. If you really want to do this right, what you should be thinking about is multiple layers of thin film nanostructures that carry high power, which is capacitor, high energy, which is a battery, uh, solar, which, which uh, scavenges uh, 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 the sun's energy, putting that all together. And the more you can put it all together in one piece at the nanoscale, the easier and more efficient the job will be, at least I think it's one reasonable way to look at it. That's probably subject to some debate. OK, well, large-scale systems. If we're going to deal with the energy storage problem, we have to think about kilowatts, megawatts, ultimately terawatts. Think of the grid that you know the electric wires that nobody wants to live under and the power that they're carrying. So if you think about the windmills that have been proposed, and you think about solar farms, the storage systems that we'll need are truly large scale. And I said the things we're proposing are 100 billion per square inch. So that, that makes the computer world look like nothing in terms of aggregation and integration. And of course, there are, there are huge reliability and yield problems associated with that. And of course, as I said, the time varying and unpredictable character of supply and demand of energy sources here makes things much harder because now you're going to want to distribute this energy and know where you put it so that it doesn't overcook part of your storage material. There are lots of issues that come up from that. So we have to think about how do you manage the power? How do you manage the defect densities? And you may create defects as you go along. Uh, you know lithium ion batteries are dangerous. They are on the YouTube. Uh, movies of lithium ion battery fires. You do not want to be thinking about this. It is not a totally safe world yet in terms of batteries. And so we've got to think about safety and how we manage systems for safety. Okay, I hope I didn't cause anybody to lose sleep tonight. <laughs> okay, so to make these very large scale storage systems, we have to think about how do you put the pieces together? So this is an attempt to portray down here a little tiny storage cell. The 
It's the kind of thing that we built already, but you're going to make resilience of them. And so how are you going to put all of that together? Well, we think we're going to take these cells and have a form factor maybe this large that has hundreds of these cells, like hundreds of chips could be, and put them on a board and package them, as you see here. And those go onto another board into a system. But in order to manage that, we're going to have to think about sensors that tell us how these chips are behaving. We're going to have to have, I think, control chips that manage the power. Because if I just took a lot of power out of this one, it's probably hot. And so if some power comes in from my window, I don't want to put it there. So we're going to have to think about active power management considerations, managing heat. Managing defects that may be generated during operation because we don't want fires from our batteries. And the more you think about this kind of system, the more you realize that if we can use the techniques that we know how to use today, or things like it, from semiconductor and LCD manufacturing, where we make high-tech kind of stuff, the more we can do down at these at these levels. Uh, the easier it's going to be. So thinking about the integration at the lower levels is certainly part of uh, where I think we should be. We looked at an application uh, with Ray Adamidas, uh, Sengok Lee, and Bruce Jacob uh, for a proposal not too long ago. And we were thinking about what we learned from Henry Leoke at the Office of Electricity, which is that we mostly focus on batteries and energy, but power is important particularly power leveling. So this is a picture of wind and, and solar. There's solar right there. I'm sorry, it's hard to see that. The demand curve. So you've seen some of this stuff. What you really want to do is what's called power leveling. So you want one set of devices that grab power efficiently, store it, and then give it up when necessary to take the peaks out of those curves. And that's to be done by a high power device and then the rest of the job is done by a high energy device. So you need a combination, a kind of hybrid to do that. And so we looked at what might be involved in a nanostructure based supercapacitor system to level out these excursions of, of power on short time scales. And so we, we sized this in an approximate way for application to a 15 kilowatt uh, uh, storage system that you might have in a remote village. Actually, that's about what the emergency generator in my backyard does. It's about the same size. Uh, or, and it runs on propane, fossil fuel. Uh, or uh, something on the grid level, which might be of order 100 megawatts. And so we think that we should be anticipating systems applications like this. Last thing I want to touch on uh, before I summarize is manufacturability. None of this is of any value if we can't make it. And so we have to put a focus on what kind of equipment is going to do each of these processes. Uh, can the sequence of processes be compatible? That's a well-known problem in all these uh, high-tech industries like the semiconductor industry. And then how do you optimize the operations that are involved in this process sequence? But of course, anybody who works for any of the companies in the energy business will tell you the only issue is cost. And so we have to think about cost. And what that means is, cost of the equipment that goes into the manufacturing facility, how much it costs to keep it running, and then there's an elegant <coughs> prescription for how to think about that and evaluate it. It's called cost of ownership, or models for this, and so on. Uh, in terms of the processes, uh, a lot of wet processes we have on hand. So, you know, the big TV panels are much larger than this. They roll out of these LCD factories from LG and Samsung and so on. Most of that Essentially, everything that can do is done with wet processes. And so there are huge machines that will do that kind of thing. But then I show you the example I'm close to, which is on the player deposition. And that's still in the research lab. It's just starting to hit manufacturing. And where it's doing that, it's only for breakers, which are this big, not for rollers. That has to be a lot cheaper. And the problem is, it's hard to get it cheaper because it's a vacuum process. And uh, I mean, it's slow throughput, the pumps break, all the kind of stuff that <coughs> my students don't have in the lab all the time. But 
a lot is happening, even on something as challenging as ALD. So people are now looking at roll-to-roll -roll processing, so you make it like saran wrap or like aluminum foil, and working to atmospheric pressure. This is the first embodiment that, that we've seen. Uh, David Reedy and Kodak have proposed this kind of thing. And the idea is you have a roll of the storage material that's going to your battery, maybe this wide, and it's going, I don't know, five feet per second or something like that to your factory. And you build the gas distribution heads that deliver the A molecule, then the B molecule, then the A and the B, as the roll goes over the A and B sources. And so you see all of that here. And then you, you, you put in one molecule here, and then you pump it away. And you put in another molecule, pump it away. And the other molecule, pump it away. So this has become a really hot thing. Uh, I was involved in, in running the ALD conference uh, in June. And this was a, just fascinating how much interest there is in this. Of course, that's because there's a lot of money in it. Uh, here's another company. They're doing essentially the same kind of thing. They call it the gas uh, bearing technology, where the roll goes like this, and it goes past one, one precursor, and then the other precursor, and so on. There's a machine made in vision for doing this. So I think it's really serious, and I think it's going to happen. Uh, this is some work done by Cambridge Nanotech. Uh, uh, Ray Adamitis works with them, doing the modeling. For them. I don't know if he was involved in this or not, but this is showing the kind of design that you have to do to understand the chemistry and the flow physics that's involved in making this kind of idea work. So, little nuance to the story is that uh, Ray and I, with John Kidder, quite some years ago, this was uh, two, year 2001 or something, we got a patent for a programmable shower head. It does essentially what you see there. It puts gases in one way and then pumps them back up through the shower head. This was a new concept at the time. We had a nice little program to use for chemical definition, but fortunately, ALP was in existence. We were just thinking about it. We wrote some paragraphs about it. The claims covered it, so we think we've got an important patent in this field. And we actually were thinking ahead of the curve in terms of how do you control a process where chemical reacting species have to be delivered to do, to do film growth. OK, so to wind up, I want to just say a few uh, things about systems. The metrics for manufacturing for the batteries and capacitor systems of the future are the ones that you recognize from semiconductors, LCD panels, hard disk drives, and so on. Uh, how do you put together chips to massive levels of innovation? How do you manage yield? How do you do process integration? All that kind of stuff. And what's important for those are the research skills that you have here in ISR. Hierarchical ways to do modeling at multiple length scales. How do you do a simulation of the system in real time, optimization and trade-off analysis. This is the other side of the coin. And these skills are really essential for any of next generation storage technology to ever become real. And the thing that I think is most important in thinking about this, uh, the people in this are certainly know how these skills can apply to different applications. But there's something I think is somewhat different about nano. And that's the fact that we don't know the physics and chemistry and biology very well. And that's being discovered as we go along. So what's the right answer? Well, the scientists might say, well, wait till you know the laws of nature, and then you can figure out the system. Wrong answer. The right answer is you can build systems models and start understanding how you put things together with the system stuff from rudimentary models of the physics and chemistry. And you can do a sensitivity analysis. And that will tell you, well, the answer that I get at the systems level depends on how well I know the physics of that piece, but not that piece. And so, in a sense, doing parallel systems with materials and nano kinds of stuff is essential to prioritize what's the important physics and chemistry science to get out of the problem. So I think there's a partnership here, which I find absolutely fascinating, and which I hope I've been able to 
give you a, a little feeling. So let me conclude. Uh, we need to have huge advances. Like the R means revolutionary, not just turn the crank. This is, this is a big deal. We have, have to have new paradigms in energy storage to be able to make the most of the resources that we have, to be able to use new, renewable, and uh, earth friendly energy sources. Uh, we think that nanostructures are the answer to this. We've got a lot to learn. We've got to build a lot of nanostructures and systems around. But I think there's every reason to believe that this is the right direction to be looking at. And even though these things are very little and they look like all material science and physics and stuff like that, the systems challenges are there all the way from the nanoscale to the application scale at a global level. And so I think it's a rich field for ISO. And I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Depend on the lights all the way. So we have time for a few questions. John. Okay, so let's start from the very beginning. Uh, one of the challenges in future energy systems is that uh, you actually have to produce and consume locally because you cannot afford the cost of transmission. Therefore, trying to to, to take the things from the nano to macro may actually not be possible with the technology we're talking about. So have you thought about in every work you're doing of stimulating nature and trying to do things that they produce energy and they make it so that they can use it immediately locally? Well, the problem with, with that is that your demand curve doesn't match the supply curve. And you can't control that. But we have examples in nature that discover. Because for which application do you have in mind as an example? Plants. Photosynthesis. I mean they, they, whatever they produce in or the ocean, okay, what you do is actually photosynthesis happening in the ocean and cleaning and all that stuff. That happens at a very small scale over a large distributed area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but instead of going producing, going up storing it and then using it. Using it here. Well, it, it, it certainly is true that nature knows how to do this just fine. Maybe evolution is Because if you follow the, the path which you correctly pointed out for the system of design, and you try to scale up, you try to talk total cost of ownership with these variable resources you're talking about in terms of wind and energy and so forth. What people start realizing, this is actually undermining many of the initiatives on the so called smart grid, is that the cost of transmission is true. Yes. yes. Yeah, but there's a different solution to that. Okay. So, so the one you're suggesting is biologically inspired and correct for nature. But we can't. But we can't control when you want to turn on your television compared to when the the windmill in your backyard started winding down. Right? So, so we certainly need storage. I think the the more interesting question is. Uh, how to disperse energy storage? Can you do it at a residential level? Can you do it at a neighborhood level? Or do you have to do it all on the grid level? And I think there's a very strong movement to think about regional and residential. You have definitely the trend in photovoltaic, right? In photovoltaic, you are going to small units, yeah. larger, larger, larger. But the idea is exactly what I do. I mean, the, the most recent work. Mm -hmm. Trying to say, I have a single roof, I use two houses. I have a few houses. I use it in the, as much as I can in that neighborhood. Yeah. Depending, of course, on other parameters. Because when you start, you know, since we don't have storage, and I don't think storage is going to scale, we can discuss that. Uh, that's the solution. Wind is much more difficult. Wind is much more difficult. Are there good resource. Okay. Yeah. But, I mean, this is a really, really a rich systems issue. Well, how do you distribute the responsibility at, at what, what uh, spatial scale? Now, the other question I have, which is more technical, is when I try to go and combine material synthesis and geometry, right, and try to do performance, because I've tried it, 
and then kind of moving on to the nanostructure, you know, the, the kind of the cones, the thing, you know, the entropy cones structure at some point, right. where it seems like the issues are, I'm not sure, but manufacturability, stability, and I just wanted you to say a few, a little more about kind of what the issues are. Well, it's, it's a very early stage, and this is called a 3D solid state pattern, this, this, this entropy structure. And that's only in research. I think we can make that. We can make conformal layers to do that. We're, I think we'll have that some kind of prototype on. I don't know if it'll work, but we'll have made the structure within a year or something like that. I'm much more worried about the fact that most of the people doing that are not doing simulation. That's the question. Is this a good thing? I mean, we've been talking very recently about, OK, how long can these nanowires be? We know we want to put them closer and closer together because all the performance metrics get better. But at some point, we've got a voltage drop across the wires. You know, there's electrokinetic flow, so the electrolyte may go the wrong way. And then you may get depletion at high power, so maybe all that stuff down at the bottom doesn't help you at all. So I guess what I'm saying is that most of the people working in this field know how to do the kind of materials part. But only a few are actually looking at the systems part, because it's a systems issue. A few? Who? Uh, well, Bruce Dunn knew about that, and there was this one paper, but it's not much. No, and, and so I'm, I'm more worried about that part of it, because, you know, we could spend uh, all of your money, your tax money, for five, ten years in the center. We'd love to do that, right? <laughs> But building longer and longer wires when maybe a simple simulation will tell us there's a point of diminishing return. Stop it at spec ratio of 50. There's going to be some limitation, right? Yeah. yeah. And we don't, we don't know that. Yeah, and we have to know that. So, the other thing you touched upon, which I wanted to ask you, it looks like, right, that you're going to have to address at some point composition angle. Composition? Composition angle. You're going to have to make these pieces. And then you have to understand how to make them together and whether that's possible at all. Yeah. And that is the weakest uh, part of what we may want to call system science. We don't even know this question. I don't know. From simple question. I don't think that's the weakest. No, from yeah. the system science point. From the system. Ah. Oh. Okay. Well, well, even for very simple properties, you don't know how to do things so that certain properties, you know, compose that. You know, and you know. Therefore, people uh, got into more uh, blocks, right? Making simpler blocks so that people can yeah, sure. simpler. Uh, so wh why I'm asking this question? Because you said something. You said, ah, you said, if I uh, do correctly, if I am to do correctly, correctly, that let's try to do integration more at the nano level. Yeah. I don't know if that's. Uh, I want to debate. I don't know if that's going to happen. I, I, I did have reservations about it. In, in terms of. Uh, performance per unit volume, performance per unit weight, and perhaps even cost. That's very desirable. But the complexity is not coming. Okay, we have Avis and then Marcus and then those who the last Avis. Okay. I thought that we're back myself, we're going to have a lot of time for questions. Well, <laughs> that's an important topic. <laughs> or is that direct opinion? Because if you're yeah, early, yeah. you don't want to have debate. <laughs> but there are some people that they need to leave, so I just want to do you that. Know, okay. Gary's going to hang around, so you can ask him more questions. I had a, a question about one of your earlier. Okay. Um, that had a beautiful straight line. Then at the bottom of the Yeah, I don't know what that mess is. But I know that one of the big issues there has been you, you put the seed, the catalyst seed, on the surface, and then the nanowire grows. But what is the interface between the nanowire and the, the, the bottom the surface look like? And you know, a lot of the failure, I didn't have time to talk about these silicon nanowires that everybody wants to pay. When the lithium goes in, you get 4.4 lithium per silicon. So the volume expansion is huge. So what happens? The silicon breaks into little pieces, right? And one of the things it'll do is it'll fall off, disconnect. Now it's not connected to a current code. So it's not 
there are a lot of that's kind of issues. I just want to ask a bigger picture question. Everybody basically wants to build a really smart grid, but they see it as that the only reason we need to do that is because we have really dumb appliances. I mean, the, like my microwave oven will only operate if you give it exactly 120 volts. And the grid is managed so that it always supplies my house all day long with this very well-conditioned power. But I can see that if we had smarter houses, smarter appliances, then we need to use my, my microwave maybe 10 minutes a day. Why can't it store a kind of very ill-conditioned power when it comes into my house, which might be what I get from the window? And then I wouldn't need such a, a huge investment in this very sophisticated smart grid with all the transmission and all the battery on that telephone pole. That could be part of all the smart appliances. Why have we sort of formulated the problem in this way where it's a smart grid problem and not a smart appliance? Uh, wait a minute. What you say is no quiet. People can incorporate the smart appliances into the smart grid as well. Right, we have some smart appliances like my phone. Remember, the main definition of smartness even for kids with consumers, not so much for the grid in their living So the easiest application of what people may want to call smart grid is stupid things like I go in and make the lights go down, or why do you leave your computer on, I turn it off, and you go home and things like that. There were studies in California, 70% savings in buildings that just keep like that, leaving the computer on, especially the screen. Why? Because you don't want to meet the email, even if you don't look at it. Think like that. You call that smart? Okay, fine. You call that smart grid? Fine. People do. And there, there are, if you go into talks, uh, they will tell you that, that they, 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 they... But I'm more talking about the electric utilities do not like it when the power level, when the voltage yeah, serves. How, why can't we have systems that tolerate all those kinds of... So I think they do, they do, they do. The electric grid is not a problem. The electric grid is liable. I think the problem is in the technology, what you call smart grid versus smart appliance, you don't know what. I don't draw a distinction. But the point is worth thinking. I mean, I can, I can save gazillions of dollars with simple things like this, and then the question is, who needs that? But that's for the speaker, not for me. No, I don't think I have an answer. <laughs> Good question. But, but I will say that if we think about how these devices for storage interact with time varying currents and voltages from sources and from demand, the DC to AC conversion and voltage level that's involved, these are all challenging problems. I mean, all these devices are not linear voltage. So there, there's a lot of power management problems there. I don't know whether it's better to solve them at the level of storage or at the level of the appliances. I don't know if you know the motor that runs the fan on your refrigerator or something like that can, can handle that. But there's a lot of power management issues. I have a question about the absolute value of capacity when you put it what is your dream that you want to be? Realistic, I mean. Absolute. How, how much do you think you can store huh. with this kind of technique? I don't know how to answer that. But if it, it, it but depends on where it. I'm getting at. There's going to be a physical limit, okay? Because. Yes, yes. I mean, you can have all the densities you want. No, I'm not sure it's a physical limit. limit. It's probably a practical limit. It's that good. all the degradation mechanisms limit how. So, for example, in the electrostatic device, which is probably the least relevant today, because most of the energy devices are going to be electrochemical. But in that one, remember I showed those little peaks that are formed and you build the capacity over that? So we had breakdown fields that were very low, like you know, three, three megavolts per centimeter. You should get 10 or 12 at least. Mm -hmm. right? So we had to shape those to get up to 10 or 12. I think it's those kinds of design mechanisms and the physics associated with those geometries that are going to determine what the storage capability is. I mean, you know, to get the electrodes too, the wires too close to each other, something will go wrong. Yeah. I just don't know where. Like your laser. <laughs> I think this was a plan. Yeah. Well, let's, let's thank our office. speaker.
Dad is going to stick around, and I also want to encourage our students to take a, one of the folders for IAI in case if you're interested in internship and other opportunities that are provided by you.